Um, last week when I gave this word, um, I thought I was finished. <laughs> but my pastor said otherwise. So, um, And I'm always amazed by, you know, the times that we think that we have reached the end of something. And really there, we have just begun. And just like what's happening in the system of churches, we are just at the beginning. Um, and the beginning is where revelation comes. It's where, where hearts are, are aligned, positioning takes place. So this is a great season for us all to be in. So we're going to talk about praying again, watch and pray again. But I'm going to revisit it and turn it a different way. Last week when I delivered this message, it was a... Personally, it was a hard word for me to give, probably the hardest word for some reason that I've ever give, given before. Um, and I think it was because of um, the layers of warning that was laced within it. How, um, you know, God, Holy Spirit, Jesus, they are, they, are, they are all warning us about the times that we're in. You know, not in a scary way that we have to be fearful as believers, but in a way that we need to be in position to do what God has called us to do, which is pray. And um, I believe that in this season, um, all, of the, all of the concepts and precepts of prayer that we may have had will be erased. Because the enemy wants to make prayer so difficult for us. He wants to make it so arduous, so challenging, he wants it to be a chore on your list. You know, how many of you got lists for all the stuff you got to do? So you got to clean this and you got to pick up this. Nobody likes to do those types of chores. They, you know, you dread them. You're like, oh, you know, they got to be done. And unfortunately for many believers, prayer is just one of those things that people are like, oh, it just has to be done. You know, you know, I know I'm supposed to do this, but there's no joy in it. There's no pleasure. There's no act of privilege to even being able to pray and to be able to partner with Holy Spirit, partner with God to actually change the earth realm that we live in. You know, God is all about encounters. And a lot of times when we use the word encounters, you know, people, again, they, they blow it up and like, well, I haven't had an encounter with God. If you have spent any time with the Lord in prayer, and all prayer is is simply talking to the Lord. It is conversation. And it is not something that has to be formulaic. It is not something that has to take place in a certain place, certain, excuse me, a certain area, a certain time. It is where you are in life. We live our lives before the king. So he is watching everything that we're doing and watching everything that we're consuming and seeing. And we can partner with him in prayer. We can converse with our Heavenly Father as we go throughout our day, as we see things throughout our day. We don't have to wait, well, I'm, I'm supposed to pray at 10 o'clock, so I'm going to wait to save all my stuff to then. No, you don't got to do that. You, you talk, it's a constant conversation, so much so that I don't even have to do the formalities. You know, I'm just like, okay, God, you know, because you know, a lot of times people will start off prayers, oh, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, and they got to call, you know, like 15 names of God before they get started. He heard you when you said, you know, Father, God, oh, whatever. <laughs> he heard you. So, you know, stop putting so many limits and parameters and making it so that prayer is just for certain people or that intercessors are just certain people. We talked about that last week, and I want to give us a bit of recap, you know, even before we move forward today. But I really wanted to just start off with saying, prayer is not a chore. Say that, prayer is not a chore. Prayer is, not a chore. Prayer is, a, privilege. Prayer is a privilege. Amen. So let's turn to Matthew 26. I'm read out of the Amplified. A little bit of recap. And this is going to go right in line with what Pastor Reggie was teaching us Sunday, you know, about our responsibility in terms of the loss, in terms of reaching out to people. This is all connected. So Matthew 26, verse 36, out of the Amplified. And um, it said, Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, Olive Press. And he told his disciples, sit here. Just sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and two sons of Zebedee, James and John, he began to be grieved and greatly distressed. 
Then he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved so that I am almost dying of sorrow. Stay here and stay awake and keep watch with me. Stay here, stay awake, and keep watch with me. And after going a little further, he fell face down and prayed, my father, if it is possible that it is consistent with your will, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and he found them sleeping and said to Peter, so you men could not stay awake and keep watch with me for one hour, one hour. Keep actively watching and praying that you may not come into temptation. See, it wasn't even about Jesus. It wasn't even about Jesus in that moment. Jesus had an assignment and a call. And obviously it wasn't about them, you know, being awake and watching because they failed. Because Jesus still went on to complete his mission, amen? Otherwise we wouldn't be here. And, and it wasn't about Jesus, it was about them. Like, look, look here, it says, keep actively watching and praying so that you may not come into temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He's trying to help them out. He's trying to, Jesus always taught us lessons in the Bible. It wasn't, he wasn't just saying stuff just to say stuff. There was always messages and teachings because he was trying to pour and pour and pour on his disciples so much in such a limited period of time to help sustain them for the course and for the calling that was waiting for them. Same with us. So verse 42, he went away a second time and prayed, my father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping for their eyes were heavy. So they were, you know, they were tired. I mean, we all get tired. That's, you know, yeah, yeah. Jesus slept too. We, 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 we all get tired. But in that moment, this was an important moment. You know, this was right before Jesus going to the cross. And in that moment, this was what he asked them to do. You don't re rarely see, you know, him personally asking, you know, a few select people certain things. You know, he was teaching them, he was instructing them, he was telling, you know, disciples as a whole or followers, this is what you should do to obey my father. But he asked them for this. So verse 44, so leaving them again, he went away and prayed a third time, saying the same words once more. And then he returned to disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? He already knew. He always knows. He always knows. I mean, we think we try to hide stuff from God. He already knows. And that's why prayer is important because this is what happens in terms of um, us being separated from God and why sometimes we don't pray. We face life and different things happen and we make mistakes. We miss the mark. We slip up here. We do something wrong. And we are now ashamed. And as a result of that shame, you feel like you can't go boldly before the Father. And you're, 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 you withhold communicating with them when in that moment, in that time of need, according to Hebrews 4, that's when you need to come boldly before the throne of grace. So that's how the enemy works is to try to keep us separated from God, from conversing, from talking to the Father in the moments that we desperately need to. He said, are you still sleeping and resting? Listen, listen the hour of my sacrifice is at hand and the son of man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners whose way in nature is to oppose God. Get up, let us look, look my betrayer is near. So in, um, so the verses I wanted to focus on was where it said, watch and pray um, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing. Your intentions are good. We always got good intentions. But the flesh, if we're operating under our mere human willpower, it's always gonna be weak. We need Heavenly Father. We need Holy Spirit. We cannot fulfill our assignments in Christ based on mere human willpower. I can do it. All those self-help books, that's not going to help you. I'm not going to do it this time. Then you do it again. I've done it again. We've all made those statements. Oh, I'm never going to do this again, Lord. You know, this is the last time. And then, oh. I don't know what happened. I'm sorry. Next time, next time. 
We need the supernatural power of God, and that only comes through prayer, which is our life source. So when we're talking about watching and praying, I want to, again, break down what watching is. It's not anything overly deep. What are the behaviors and habits of people of watching people, people who watch? Because we know, we understand prayer, but what is watching? Watching people observe in order to look after, protect, or guard. Look after, protect, or guard. Those are watching people. Just like, you know, an armed security guard outside of a gate. They're looking. They're protecting what's inside. What are we protecting? We are protecting the faith of Jesus Christ. We are protecting the kingdom of God. We are protecting the souls that are currently lost. We are guarding over their, their hearts. Watching people are prepared at the biggest events or tests and trials in their life. That's why Jesus told them at that moment, you need to stay awake right now. Like this is an important time because he knew not only he was going to the cross, but they were all going to be individually tested and tried. And the only way that they were going to be able to fulfill and, and, and pass those tests was through that time of, of consecration, through that time of prayer, to, during that time of watching and being obedient to what Jesus had told them to do. Watching people are vigilant. They are fully awake. They are woke people. They are alert. They are intently focused on what is going on. It's like, you know, there's so many, you know, you've seen like the things where it'll be like, a, like somebody trying to cause a distraction. And the most obvious thing is happening. And then somebody comes by, you know, somebody with a clown nose or a monkey or something trying to get your eyes to not pay attention to what really is going on. That's the world that we live in. Because all of the smoke and mirrors, all the things that are trying, hey, look at me, look at me. Those are all the little ads and different things and posts on social media. Those are all the different pictures, all the different silly videos. All of those things want us to get our eyes off of what is really going on. Like, what is really going on in this world? And it's even for a minute, you know, like at our job, it tell, like our boss tells us that it takes like up to 21 minutes or something if you've been interrupted to get back on task. Like, just like that, you already off task. Because how many of you, may, I know I've done it where I've made up in my mind, like I'm about to pray, I'm about to do this, and then I see something pop up. Like, let me just check my, you know... And then before you know it, it's an hour past. And, and now you like the disciples. Now you're sleepy. And he like, can't you just stay awake with me for one hour? So watching people, they are spiritually prepared. Spiritually prepared. They are alert for any signs of enemy movement. You know, and watching people, they're not just watching stuff happen to them. They are doing battle with forces that are trying to oppose them from doing right. You know, we are not just watching the world and like, see, look, there's another bad influence. Look, oh, that music's bad. And we're, and we're just watching it and not doing anything about it. No, you, at watching people battle against it. They don't just say, okay, that's how it is. The world is dark. You know, this is to be expected. No, they completely fight against that. They fight against any sort of demonic forces or satanic devices to try to, to try to change or shift our focus or our minds off of Jesus. Watching people can be compared, like I said, to night watchmen or security guards. They are patrolling our cities and guarding important places of business without even having necessarily to leave their house through prayer. That is how powerful your prayers. You don't have to actually be physically on the scene to affect change. So they are staying awake so that thieves, intruders cannot gain entrance. We have allowed too many thieves and intruders to invade and to vandalize and to desecrate and to talk about our Jesus or talk about the kingdom of God. Watching people are awake 
not just for themselves, but on behalf of another. This is how it ties into Sunday. This is the godly affection. When you have godly affection for someone, you are watching for, with them. You are praying with them. You are standing in the gap with them. You know, your brother and sister don't come up to you and say, you know, I'm dealing with, you know, a health challenge, and you just like, okay, that's on you, or, you know, hope. Or we just say, well, I'll pray for you, and we don't really pray. I had to stop myself from doing that because I would say that and then you go on to do your next thing because, you know, usually it's interrupted. But that's why we got to be awake. That's why we have to be watching people because you don't know at any moment you may need to be on the scene to offer up a prayer, offer up a word, and that's why the word needs to be sown into your hearts. We don't know the time or hour, not necessarily just for Jesus' return, but the time and hour when we may need to give a word of encouragement to somebody else. And if you're not watching, if you're sleeping, if you're all up in your flesh, you don't even know anything spiritual to say. Or you like, well, let me get myself together. Let me pray first because I was all off. The no, we need to be ready. You don't know who God or Holy Spirit is going to put on our path. Amen. So watching people are awake on behalf of another. And then this is what I said last week. Watching is to sleeping as fasting is to eating. So we're in a fast. That means we abstain from eating. When you're watching, you're abstaining from sleeping. You know, you don't got to be up 24 hours. Nobody's telling you to stay up all night. But you know when God is asking you for an hour and you gave him two minutes. So watching people are aroused from sleep. Sometimes the, the and I, I think I mentioned this before, sometimes the, um, the best times that Holy Spirit will be able to capture me if I'm really busy is right when I lay my head on the pillow. Because he's like, I finally got you somewhere where there's no distractions. Because that's why when the Bible tells us when you pray, go into your secret place. You don't have to find a special room, but you need some place where there is not outside distractions coming in and out. That's the secret place. A secret place can be in your car like Anissa, Prophet Anissa showed us when she prays in her car. I pray in my car too because I drive a lot. I'm from Evanston, so I'm driving here all the time. Those are crucial times that we can have to be in the secret place and to have an encounter with God because prayer is not just us talking to him, it's also us listening to what Holy Spirit is telling us and then we pray some more based on what he just told us. It's a conversation. You don't have a conversation with somebody and you, you just call somebody up and you just talk. The whole time, just straight through. Da, 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 da. And you know this what happened to me? Da, 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 da. And, da, 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 da. and then they don't, they're just like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, bye. <laughs> what is that? You ain't going to ask me how my day was, what happened with me. And sometimes we just rattle off our list. We got our confessions and we just rattling them off. And Lord, give me this. And Lord, bless this. And Lord, da, 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 da. And we don't care to listen to what he possibly might be having us do. Because most of the time, he's trying to get our focus off ourselves and on to somebody else. It was just like what they were singing. It's not about us. And it's so clear to me now, you know, in this season, this year that I'm in, because, you know, there's things that I want. I want to have babies. I want to have my twin babies. I want them right now. All right? But I can't spend all my time just sitting there praying about these babies. When there's other women that I also can stand in the gap for that believe and that will have babies as well. When there's other issues in this city that are trying to come to attack children. So why am I just focused on myself and I can focus on all the other things? Because the enemy wants us to think, well, if we don't, you know, because because we try to we place prayer as a chore and we set it to the side and we give it, you know, a little bit of time, then the little bit of time that we do have, we need to focus it, you know, on ourselves and our family and, you know, and our stuff. And God is trying to get us to think so much bigger because his word tells us, seek ye first the kingdom 
of God and his righteousness and all other things will be added. And he said that after he told us clearly how he takes care of the birds and the flowers without them having to say or want or need anything. He said that if we take care of his business, he'll take care of our business. So watching people are not insensitive to their responsibility as believers. Because when we're, we're asleep, we're insensitive to what is happening around us. Because we're not awake to see what is happening around us. And the church as a body may not necessarily be literally sleep, but it can become insensitive to its relationship with Jesus Christ. It can be insensitive to spiritual responsibilities like praying for others. And as I mentioned last week, watching people, they are not lulled into worldliness by being concerned with more ordinary or self-centered or secular pursuits rather than the spiritual work of God. Watching people don't check out through escapism. Don't just say, this world is too dark, this is too much, I'm just going to go here in my corner and do my own thing. That's not what watching people do. They don't fall on false substitutes to get temporary pleasure because they don't want to deal with the root issue of what is going on. That's all false substitutes do. It's just like a Band-Aid. It just gives you that temporary pleasure for that moment, that second, that season, that whatever, and then as quickly as you got it, it's gone. Watching people aren't like that. So, and also watching people finally don't give in to worries, cares, or anxieties, just like we were singing. We can cast our cares onto Jesus. We don't have to worry about what is happening. We know that God is in control. All right, so let's turn to Luke chapter 21. We read this last week, but I want to read it again. Luke chapter 21, verse 32 through 36, out of the Amplified. And Jesus is saying, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, this generation, those living at that definite period of time preceding the second coming, we are that generation. We are living in the time before the second coming. And we don't know how long the generation is, but we, it hasn't come yet, so we are directly preceding it. So it says, I assure you that this generation, those living at the definite period of time preceding the second coming, will not pass away until everything takes place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But be on guard so that your hearts are not weighed down and depressed with the giddiness of debauchery and the nausea of self-indulgence. Sometimes you can get sick of yourself in terms of, you know, like, do I need another selfie? Do I need another post about how great I am? Self-indulgence, you know, of, oh, this is what I bought. This, I got this new purse. I got this new car. I got this. So the nausea, sometimes it becomes, you know, sickening. Nausea, self-indulgence, and the worldly worries of life, and then that day when the Messiah returns, will not come on you like a suddenly, like a trap. He's trying to get us to be prepared, spiritually prepared. For it will come upon all those who live on the face of all the earth, but keep alert at all times, be attentive, be ready, praying that you may have the strength and ability to be found worthy and to escape all these things that are going to take place. We, as believers, can escape all these things that are taking place. Earthquakes, rumors of wars, nation, people group against people group. We, as believers, there is a route, there is a process, there is a way for us to escape and to stand in the presence of the Son of Man at his coming. So if we are not praying consistently, if we are not watching and praying, we will find it hard to not be tempted or distracted in these times. 
It's going to be hard to stand on sure ground when every day on the news it's like the biggest catastrophe. The president did this, and this is happening to the economy, and this country is attacking us, and this one's building bombs. You can't be on sure ground in certainty if you are not alert and aware and praying consistently in this season. Because all of these things are designed to shake you. Literally shake you. Shake you from what you thought. Shake you from the word of God that you had already confessed and prayed. So people around us, though, and those are like when we're talking about, you know, reaching out and showing godly affection to those around us. All those other people around us, we need to be able to watch and be alert to where they are. Because those, we may not be shaken, but those people may be shaken. And the only way that they will know that God is real and he is our sure foundation is our steadiness in the midst of shaking. Because even though there is shaking, we can still be steady in it. So that means there's two different competing things going on at the same time. It's just like in the Bible it said, in the time of famine, you will be satisfied. How can there be a famine in the land? People not having enough food to eat, yet you be satisfied. That means there's an alternate reality for us as believers. And we need to tap into that alternate reality. So when we watch, we are alert. And um, we have to get out of ourselves. Just like that word convicted me Sunday. We have to get out of ourselves because being, a, wa being watchful, being alert means that your plans are going to change all the time. You may have said, okay, I got to get home at this time. I got to do this. I got to do that. And then you see a person, you know, and Holy Spirit saying you need to talk to them. Somebody distressed or somebody you know. And you like, oh. I get into this with her, I'm, I'm going to be late about 30 minutes, and then children going to be. But where are our priorities? Because don't you think God can take care of that other stuff? That's the ordinary. That's the routine. That's the mundane stuff. He wants us to tap into our supernatural, our spiritual responsibilities. So it's going to require us to have our steps ordered by Holy Spirit. And he don't necessarily always tell us everything up front at the beginning of the day. Like, this is your schedule. Like, I would love that. I love schedules. I love things that are outlined and times and I know what I'm doing. But we have to trust the Lord in this season. When we are watchmen, we got to trust that he is leading and guiding us, that that little ebb here, that right turn here, even though it's going to take us an extra 10 minutes, it's really for our good and for somebody else's good. So we are all watchmen. Because I think before the church would always just, watchmen was just this little title, and that's why I'm so not about titles. And that's how I got over being called Pastor Kelly, because I didn't want to be called that. I didn't want to be called Minister Kelly years ago. I didn't want those titles. But then I realized God gave me revelation that I was, I am operating in that office. I'm already doing those things that people call those kinds of people. So a title isn't something that you just go after and say, this is what I'm, now I'm going to start doing this. No, you should already have grown into the title before it is officially given unto you. So we are all watchmen, whether you're a husband, you're a wife, you're a parent, you know, watchmen even over your own selves. We can't read this Bible. Like, I feel like sometimes we read this Bible and we just find ways to exclude ourselves in these scriptures. Like, okay, I'm not the, the Proverbs 31 woman, so let me turn over here to the next chapter. Okay, I'm, I didn't do that, so I'm not that. I'm not a watchman. I'm not an intercessor. I'm not a prophet. I'm not a teacher. Let me skip past 1 Corinthians. No! 
God has given us all gifts and talents, and he wants to use all of us in this season right now. We are all followers of Christ. And as a follower of Christ, you must watch and pray. You must watch and pray, just like he told his disciples. So let's see. So when we're going back to, and then also, you know, when we're talking about watching even your own selves, this is a plug to unmarried. How many of y'all unmarried fulfilled in here? Some of y'all, more of y'all in there. Y'all want to raise your hand. <laughs> Men can be unmarried and fulfilled too, amen? Amen, men and women, unmarried and fulfilled. That's why the next topic is gonna to be what about your flesh? Because you gotta watch your own self. Ain't nobody know yourself but you. Ain't nobody know your triggers but you. You have to watch yourself. Watch and pray for yourself so that you do not, just like Jesus told us in Matthew 24, that you do not fall into temptation. This is for your good, watch and pray. And some of us, when we're, dealing, when we're talking about dealing with flesh, you try to make it like, oh, well what I'm going through is so different. It ain't no different than any time in all of history. It's really not. Even these dark times that we're living in now, Go back to the Old Testament. There were dark times. There was dark times when Jezebel was in the reign and King Ahab. It was dark times. But even in those times, Jesus showed out. God showed himself strong. And that's what he's trying to show us. And that's why it's key that we pray. Because even though it may be the darkest season that we've experienced, it's also going to be the greatest season for Jesus to shine. Light can shine so much brighter when it's darker. So there's going to be so many great things that are happening that we have never even seen before as it pertains to souls and people being saved and delivered and healed. And he wants to use all of us, all of us. He told us all, we can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Amen. So that was March 21st, Monday. Come on out to Unmarried and Fulfilled. Amen. Because you got to learn how to watch your flesh. Strategies, knowing your triggers, just very simple. Because, like I said, we try to make it so deep. We try to make it like, you know, okay, well, they got this stuff out now. And, you know, and they got these videos now. It's all the same, you know. It's spirits of lust, it's spirits of perversion, it's spirits of rebellion. All of those things, those are the core. So once you tackle those things in prayer and, and getting your strategy, then you're set to deal with whatever permutation, whatever variety it comes in. So in Matthew, Jesus was telling us how we have to overcome, and this is how we overcome in the times that we're living in. It's through watching and praying. And he was trying, like I said, to teach and train the disciples and also us preparing them for their biggest trial. So how many of you have ever um, taken a test at school that you actually prepared for? Like you know you prepared for this test. Amen. I know when I took the California bar exam, I was not taking that any more time. And there's a history that with California is the lowest passage rate in all the country. Like so many people take it over four, five, six, seven times, whatever. I was like, not me. I'm doing all this stuff. You literally have to devote two to three months studying, eight hours plus a day. I'm not doing, the test alone was three days long, eight hours a day. Eight hours a day, like literally I would just come there you do your four hours, you eat some quick little sandwich, you go back, do your next four hours, go back to your hotel room, come back the next day. You don't even got time to study that in the nights in between because you're tired. So I knew I wasn't going to take that test again. I knew, and I didn't. I didn't. I declared and decreed. I prayed, and I did what I needed to do. 
So when you are really prepared for a test at school or whatever test in life, you know, the questions that the teacher may throw at you in the test to try to, you know, stump the students that they know didn't probably read the material or prepare well, when you're prepared, you see right through that trap. You're like, oh, okay, yeah, see, she thought I didn't read this book, but I did, and this is what it's about. Like, that's how I took the bars of I was like, I'm going to attack this test. Like, literally, I was like, my angel's with me. I'm right here. I was like, bring it on. And each question, I was just like, yep, dude. I just started writing as much as I could in the allotted time. I just overflowed until they told me to stop writing. <laughs> I left everything on there. But that's what, that's what we're saying. When you are prepared, when you're spiritually prepared, you can see the trap. You know, just think about traps in the natural. It's not like they're always hidden. Mouse traps, you see the box. It's not like the mouse didn't see, like they were blind or invisible and see that that was something there. You know, there may be something like a piece of cheese or peanut butter or something like that trying to entice them to go in it, but they see what's there. And watching and praying, it helps us see right through the trap of the enemy, especially, especially in the times that we're living in. That's why God is just constantly, has been constantly telling me all this year, and in terms of the church, is to wake up. We have to wake up to our responsibility. And, and even through that, God is showing me. He is teaching me to even study things that I've never studied before. Like, you should all be studying things you've never studied before in this season right now. Because he's always taking us higher and higher and higher to another level. Like, I'm studying spiritual warfare at the top of the year. Then I'm into deliverance and all this stuff. And it's like, it's not co coincidence. Because then once you know, then Lord brings people across your path to test what you know. <laughs> and you're like, How did, I wouldn't even been ready for that if that was last year. But that's how graceful and full of mercy our Lord is. Because he don't bum rush us with stuff we ain't ready for. But this is the time, this is the season. So let's turn to Revelation. Because like I said, I've been studying things I ain't never studied before. I stay away. I used to stay away from that book. I think I, I, think I read it a couple times when I was little just to see. And I was just like, yep, I'm going to stay right on the other side of the New Testament to the other ones. But it's not, it's not all scary. So Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. When talking about the church waking up in this time, in this season says in the Amplified, write this letter to the angel of the church in Sardis. This is the message from one who has the sevenfold spirit of God and the seven stars. And it says, I know all the things you do. So he's talking to the church. And that you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. So people know them there's a reputation, there's words that are being said about this church that, oh, this is the live church, this is what's that. But really, they're dead. So probably they're spiritually dead inside, maybe something that people can't see from surface. So verse 2, it says, wake up. Strengthen what little remains, for even what is left is almost dead. Like, this is a quick correction time for this church. Because it's like, you got to strengthen what little, you got to do it now. Because it may quickly go like the other. And it said, I find that your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. Do the church's actions meet the requirements of God? That's what God is saying to all churches in this season. And it says, verse 3, go back to what you heard and believed at first. Hold to it firmly. Repent and turn to me again. If you don't wake up, I will come to you suddenly as unexpected as a thief. Listen to it in the message says, write this to Sardis, to the angel of the church, the one holding the seven spirits of God in one hand, a firm grip on the seven stars of the other speaks. 
I see right through your work. See right through your programs. I see right through your outings. I see right through your songs. I see right through your prayers. I see right through your messages and your teachings. I see right through your work. You have a reputation for vigor and zest, but you're dead, stone dead. That speaks to even personal relationship with Jesus because the church and the people in it can be doing and serving and doing all of this stuff, but be spiritually dead inside. And it says, verse 2, up on your feet, take a breath. Maybe there's life in you yet, but I wouldn't know it by looking at your busy work. Nothing of God's work has been completed. So they've done a whole bunch of stuff, but for some reason they haven't completed God's work. What are we really doing? Your condition is desperate. It's just like, you know, when you take this resuscitate with the, yes, yeah, CPR. I mean, it all goes with Lifeline. I mean, this is what we do. We are resuscitating people from their spiritual deadness. Said, so think of the gift you once had in your hands, the message you heard with your ears. Grasp it again and turn back to God. If you pull the covers back over your head and sleep on, oblivious to God, I'll return when you least expect it. Break into your life like a thief in the night. So we see here that the church needs to be vigilant in our core responsibilities. We need to be on guard because just like the world is being deceived, the church can also and the people in it can be deceived. We have to be on guard against deception, against apathy, against neglect. We have to be watching. We have to be alert to the spiritual dangers and even the physical ones that are going on around us. We have to watch everything that's going on, even when you're in the service. It's not about you. What happens when in our services there are equal number of unsaved and saved? We need to be looking out for each other, for the ones that don't know, the ones that don't know where that book in the Bible is. We can't just be like, okay, I'm on my own stuff. Or those that don't understand, well, why do you pray like this? Or why do you sing that song? And why do you have a heavenly language. We got to be able to answer those questions. Be there for those people in those times of need. And it starts with us being alert and keeping fresh. We have to stay fresh with fresh oil to be spiritually prepare, prepared and ready. It's just like when we did Lifeline West and the year anniversary and pastor had about the oil and tree and how to stay. We have to stay connected to the oil. Turn to Matthew 25. Amen. So Matthew 25, verse 1. In the Amplified again. And it says, The kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. So again, don't exclude yourself. I ain't a virgin. Listen to the message. <laughs> we read it like, well, I'm a dude. It ain't me. No. <laughs> so the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish thoughtless, without forethought, and five were wise, sensible, intelligent, prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they did not take any, and then it has extra oil with them. But when I studied this, they were saying that extra was added as context to kind of show even the gravity of it, but really most of them hadn't brought any oil. 
so verse 4, but the wise took flasks of oil along with them, also with their lamps. And while the bridegroom lingered and was slow in coming, they all began nodding their heads and they fell asleep. Just like Jesus told us. But at midnight, there was a shout. Behold, the bridegroom, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins got up and put their own lamps in order. And now the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. You know when you're about to run out of gas in your car. Yeah. If you got a car from 2000, especially at like 10 and up, they usually show you the miles. But how many of us wait? I'm, I'm one of them too, but I, I never ran out of gas. So. But it'll get to zero, but this is because I blame this on my husband because he... He showed me this. He's like, okay, when it's at zero, that's just an estimate. It's not, that's not really. So I'll drive on zero for a little bit. He drives on zero a little bit more comfortably than I do. I, I'm like, I need to find one soon. But we know when we are running empty and running dry of the oil. Oil represents Holy Spirit, the anointing. We know when we're a little bit too ordinary, when we're a little bit too fleshy when we a little bit too much like everybody else. So when they saying, you know, well, we didn't know, we, we give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. Y'all knew. Because they had the same information that the wise people had to get the oil. They was there with them. Why didn't they go? But the wise replied, there will not be enough for us and for you. Go instead to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And it wasn't like they were trying to be mean. They literally did not have enough to share. They had enough for theirs. They were spiritually prepared. I can't give you the anointing that I have received from Holy Spirit. I can't give you what me and Holy Spirit dealt with or prayed about in the morning. I can't, you know, I can pray for you, but I can't give that to you. And it says... But while they were going away to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were prepared went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Later, the other virgins also came and said, Lord, Lord, now they got their oil. So they like, Lord, Lord, you know, open the door to us. But he replied, I solemnly declare to you, I do not know you. I am not acquainted with you. Watch, therefore, give strict attention and be cautious and active. Our watching is not watching that is passive. It is a watching that is active. We have to be actively looking and preparing and praying and seeing what is going on and doing corresponding faith actions with that. It says, for you know neither the day, the hour when the Son of Man will come. So, as we said, keeping oil, we got to keep fresh oil. We got to maintain, we got to maintain the oil, the, 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 the we got to remain ready, readiness. You know, just think about firemen. They always have to be ready. So they always have their suit on or some form of it. They always got the stuff near the door. They always got the truck ready to go that at any moment they get a call, they can just run down the, the, pole, jump in the truck, and go. We got to be like that. So many of us are being awakened by what's going on in our lives, and like, we, it's like when we, we, when we get awoke, awoken from sleep abruptly. Like, nobody likes to be woken up, like, hey, wake up. <laughs> or when you're little, your mom, like, wake up, you're sleeping too, you know, yelling and screaming or something like that. You know, that's not how you want to, but some of us are unfortunately doing that with regard to what is happening. And we need to always just already always be awake. And when we talk about praying and staying awake and our watch is not just for ourselves but for others, know that your pastors also keep watch over you. 
So there is a complete relationship to this watching. It is not just reserved for the pastors. It is all of us. We are all watching. Turn to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13, 17, out of the Amplified. And it says, obey your spiritual leaders and submit to them, continually recognizing their authority over you. For they are constantly keeping watch over your souls. Watch over your souls. That's why, as Pastor says, it is always important where you go to church, who you say your spiritual heads are, who your pastors are because they're keeping watch over your souls and guarding your spiritual welfare as men who will have to render an account of their trust. And then it says, do your part to let them do this with gladness. There should be a joy in us watching one from another and not with sighing and groaning, for that would not be profitable to you. We have to remain ready in this season as God's agents on this earth you never know when you will need to be on assignment and spiritual preparedness protects us from succumbing to temptation it protects us from being distracted the best way to prepare for the test that is before you is to prepare for them I mean it's just simple as that you have to be prepared because otherwise the enemy will steal pockets of your time. It's just like every year we say, this, it's already May, like when this year? This year is on flying by. And it's going to continue to just fly by. You need to make sure you do an account of where you are spiritually, what you are studying spiritually, what you are praying spiritually. Month to month, it shouldn't be the same. You should be growing. Ask yourselves, what around me on a day-to-day -day basis gets my eyes off of Jesus? And it don't have to be evil things. Your children, they need food. You know, you got to feed them. That could get your eye off in the, in the second. Or your finances or your job, but when we're dealing with prayer and we're trying to demystify prayer, you will see that those things don't have to get your focus off of Jesus. You can do those things as you are talking to the Lord. You can do your chores and talk to the Lord. Because a lot of times we think, like, we don't have nothing good to say to God. You know, so, like, why am I? And really, God doesn't, ma doesn't care if we only got good stuff necessarily to say to him. He wants to hear about your day because he's already seeing it. Like, look in the Psalms with David. David would just pour out whatever he was going through. They saw after me. They killing me. They doing this and they doing that. And, and get these people and get my enemies. And, oh, I'm feeling so sad. I'm so depressed. I'm so whatever. That's how we got to talk to the Lord because it's like when we come in those moments when we feel insecure, when we don't feel enough, when we don't feel like we have it all together, when we feel weak in some way, as soon as we start talking to him, peace comes. A word comes. I love you. You can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. This trial has not come to overtake you. I have delivered every righteous person out of every trouble that they're facing. This is not meant to harm you. This is not for your death. You shall live and not die. You shall, you shall experience the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. But it starts with us having to be humble enough in our brokenness. That's how he wants you. So sometimes I may start off in prayer sad, crying, broken, just saying a few words, Jesus, I'm, I'm tired, I'm weak, I don't know, you know, what's going on, I don't know, whatever. But as soon as I start 
release in those words. Comfort comes. And then I start releasing what he wants me to say. That I am more than an overcomer. That I am a victor. That I always win. So, but it starts with us humbling ourselves and coming before the Father. So that's why Jesus was telling us all throughout Matthew and all throughout the Gospels, he, was, he didn't leave us in this world that we're living in without any sort of preparation. That's why he was always telling us, be careful that no one misleads you, no one deceives you into error. He said many people will come in his name and, and, and try to lead many astray. Many false prophets will rise up and deceive you, lead you into error. There will, you know, be so many signs and wonders coming from demonic places. But when you are spiritually prepared, when you are watching and praying, you can see through the trap. You know, I just heard even last week some ridiculousness about some church having Beyonce music in the church. Somebody was trying to reach the lost. They're going to play her song. We got to see through the trap. We have to see through the trap. We have allowed the thief to break into our lives. And pastor always says, not on our watch. Not on our watch. Well, in order for us to say not on our watch, we need to be watching. Because some of us will always say, not on our watch, not on my watch, no sickness coming to them. But you haven't prayed. You ain't even sat before the Lord with that person on your mind. Release that name to the Lord at least. We have to be watching and praying for one another. One last scripture. Turn to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, 42 out of the Amplified. It says, watch, therefore, give strict attention. Like, how many times Jesus got to tell us to watch? I mean, these ain't even half all the scriptures where he said that. He said, watch, therefore, give strict attention. Be cautious and active, for you do not know in what kind of day, whether a near or remote one, your Lord is coming. But understand this, had the householder known in what part of the night, or whether in the night or in the morning, watch the thief was coming, he would have watched and would not have broken into his house to be undermined and broken into. So this is saying, of course, if we knew beforehand when a thief was going to break into our house, we would be on watch. We'd have guards there. We'd call the police. We got our, you know, protection. We all, we, we watch and an alert. But that's not how the thief comes. So that's why we have to always be watching. Because you don't know any time anything can get your focus off of God in this season. And the only way that we can maintain our sure footing, maintain where our place is with the Lord is through watching and praying. And it starts with the relationship of conversing with our Heavenly Father on a daily, multiple daily basis. Just little sentences I say to the Lord throughout my day and the accumulation of which, who knows how long it is. But it's all throughout my day. Lord, I'm tired this morning, but, you know, I believe that you're going to give me strength and you're going to help me get through this. And, you know, work is challenging right now. There's this problem I can't figure out or I can't solve. But I know, Holy Spirit, you lead me into all truth. So show me how... I can solve this problem at work. I can be effective. Give me favor with my bosses. Give me favor with other people around me. Let me be a light. Like, this is what we need to be doing. And in order for us to do that, we have to dismantle any sort of fear and rejection. Just like what Pastor was talking about Sunday. Because it's not about us. So many of us are scared to reach out to another person because we're watching and praying for one another. So many of us are scared because, oh, they may not receive that right. They may reject. They're not rejecting you. Don't take it personally. It's not about you. And unfortunately, fear is the thing that keeps us from 
joining small groups. I don't know about them people. I don't know who all going to be there. I don't know what they're going to be talking about. I don't want them to make me share something. Fear of coming to different events like Unmarried and Fulfilled. Oh, it's a round table. That means they're going to expect everybody to be there and say something. I don't want to say nothing. I'm just going to stay at home. I'm fine. It keeps you from dealing with people that the Lord has equipped. Because if Holy Spirit is giving you, you know, a person to talk to, then that means he's already equipped you with what to say to that person. But we, unfortunately, go back to God and be like, well, what, do I, what am I supposed to do? Or are you sure? Is it that one for real? And he already spoke. <laughs> so we have to get outside of ourselves. Being comfortable never leads to satisfaction. God is always pushing us to another level. And I feel, when I feel completely satisfied, is when I am completely stretched by God, when I have obeyed him in what he has called me to do. Just like coming here tonight and speaking about watch and pray again. Because after I told you, after last week, I had to put them notes away, and I was like, I'm done with this for this season. I was physically challenged last week, and it was just like, you know, what is going on? But I believe that the Lord wanted to release that word and even wanted us to get a second round at it so that it continually be fresh, because this is where we are in this season right now. So how many of you are going to be watchers? I don't even see no hands. Okay. <laughs> Say, I am a watcher. I am a watcher. I'm a watcher. I'm a prayer. I watch and pray. Every day. For those who need it. And for myself. I will not miss the mark in this season. In Jesus' name, amen.